I am blessed. in my strength, but it's in the strength and the power of the Almighty God. Yes. 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 Now i got it adjusted the way I want it. I want to give honor to God, first of all, and to the pastor, Pastor Williams, and to his dear, lovely wife, a dear friend of mine. I just, I am so proud of her. That's all I can say. That's all I can, yeah, you can give her a hand, praise. You know, God is the God of transition, amen, and all of us are transitioning in some way, shape, or form, but isn't it amazing how God gives us the strength and he's equipped us already? Yes, the shoes might be uncomfortable right now, but guess what? He's got shoes designed for you, amen, and I am so proud to call you the First Lady of Foursquare, amen. I thank God for her, amen. I thank God for Pastor Will. Son of the gospel, I can say that because we grew up in the ranks. Uh, yeah, we sung together, um, spirited, right? Oh, wow, we go back a ways. Yes, we do. We grew up in the church, and I thank God for the church mother, Mother Clark, uh, today. And for my mother, Mother Clark, and all the, all the church mothers here. I can say uh, Mother Katie Benning over there, and Mother Alice, and Mother Edwards. I don't want to, you know, leave every, Mother Williams. I don't want to leave out any of the mothers. Mother Beatrice, yes, she's in the ranks too, amen. Amen, I remember when they weren't the mothers, but now they are talking about transition, amen. Transition is something else, isn't it? Because sometimes you don't know what kind of shoes you're gonna go into, amen. The seasons change, and then your shoes change. Uh, us ladies, we know how it is. We wanna freshen up our wardrobe. I'm looking at Sister Missionary Frances, cause she's the shoe queen. I call her the shoe queen. And you know, sometimes you get tired of the same old shoes and you have to, you know, freshen it up a little bit, you know what I mean? Maybe a pop of a color here or there. But I thank God for the transition in my life, amen. I thank God because I am saved. I am sanctified and I am filled with this precious Holy Ghost. I have no other mind. It's too late in the evening for me to be turning back. What am I gonna turn back for? He's been too good to me. For me to turn back. Amen. You know, I thought about the subject and it's talking about prayer and the power of prayer and the book uh, by Stormy O. Martin. I read the book at least two or three times. So when it called me, it struck the heartstrings in me because prayer is dear to me. I remember growing up across the street, 229, how we had shut in 
and how we had them hard chairs, <laughs> them folding chairs, and we were praying our hearts out. Amen. I see Sister Jackie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember Mother Bree Love and her noonday prayer. Amen. And I remember being in, at Syracuse University, leaving the campus to hurry up to get to noonday prayer because I knew there was power in prayer. Nobody had to prime me or prompt me to come to prayer. And you know what? The thing about prayer is it is a way of life. It is a way of life. It's not just something you just do before you go to sleep at night. It's not just something that, you know, is customary to do when you get up in the morning. But it is a way of life for the woman of God. And since this is Women's, women's Day, I, I would like to address the women, and of course, the men are not excluded. All right. Prayer is talking and listening to God and being in fellowship intimately with Him. Amen. There's a time when we pray and we're seeking God's face, and then there are times when we're praying when we're asking for answers from Him. Amen. Isn't it amazing how God knows our heart even before we open our mouth? He knows, he knows, he knows, he knows what we need, doesn't he? Yes, he does. He knows. We have a uh, group in our missionary, that's part of our missionary circle at uh, St. John's, Greater St. John's, it's called Prayers for Squares. And what we've been doing is making quilts. And when we make these quilts, we then put ties on them. And, and as we're tying these quilts, the ties with throughout the quilt, we're praying for the individual that's going to receive the quilt. And you know what? It deepened my prayer life even more because as we gathered around the quilt, it wasn't about the quilt. Maybe, maybe the colors weren't quite matching the way they should, but it was about the love that was placed in there and the impartation of God's spirit as we prayed uh, around these quilts. And it's amazing how we've heard testimonies of these quilts, how they brought comfort, how they brought joy to the people, the lives that they were brought into. Yes. Amen. I said that to say this, don't underestimate the power of prayer. Right. Don't underestimate the power of prayer in your home. Right. Don't underestimate the power of prayer in your workplace. Don't underestimate the power of prayer in your community, and most of all, don't underestimate the power of prayer in your church. That's right, that's right. This is my home church, and I, I just thank God because I have to go back to this again because I was at the um, service on last Sunday, and that was the Founders Day service, and I began to look back upon the years that I spent, you know, in Four Square, right. from one building to the other. And thankful for the foundation, but that foundation couldn't have happened unless the founders were praying. Mother Lydia was praying. Pastor W.S. Clark was praying. Pastor Kenneth Clark was praying. Mother Helen Clark was praying. And now we've got Elder Williams and Sister Teria, uh, uh, Terry Williams, excuse me, praying. It is a foundation that's built layer upon layer, the foundation of prayer. All right. We're going to go to the scripture here, and we're going to talk about Hannah for a few minutes. Uh, a scripture that's near and dear to my heart, because here we have a woman who had a desire. And we're going to start with uh, 1 Samuel 1 and the 10th verse. And I'll give you a few minutes to get there. We're talking about a woman who had a request, yeah. All right. and it seemed like God wasn't hearing what she had to say. How many of you have been praying on some things, and you're like, God, really? Do you really hear me? Do you? Can you really hear, hear what I'm saying, God? My heart is crying out to you. Do you hear what I'm saying? All right. Right. Uh -huh. So in the first chapter of 1 Samuel, in the 10th verse, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she bowed about and said, Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid and remember me and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man child. She was specific. She said, a man child. Then I will give him unto the Lord 
all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. But look here, uh, further down here in the 12th verse, and it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now he was looking at her like, what in the world is she doing? Now Hannah, she spake in her heart only, her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunk. She's on the altar praying, and the man of God thought she was drunk. Right. Let's move along here. I'm going to go back to that in a few minutes. And Eli said unto her, How long will thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, have I spoken hitherto. She let him know without disrespecting him that you are out of line. I am not drunk, but I am praying to the Almighty God. Then Eli answered and said, oh, he, he caught it. He said, go in peace. And the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, let thy handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat and her countenance was no more sad. Right. Let's go back a little bit to find out why she was sad. Uh -huh. In the fourth verse of the first chapter there, yeah. and when the time was come that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peniah his wife and to all her sons and her daughter's portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. That's why she was sad. Yes, and her adversary, who was Penina, also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. So we find here a story of two women, tale of two women, I'll say it like this. Well, one is just having baby after baby after baby after baby. Uh -huh. And the other one wants a child so bad and it doesn't seem like she can have not a one. But what's happening here, too, is as she's praying, there's some distraction going on. Right. There is somebody in the camp, instead of praying with her, uh -huh. you would think, because she's a mother and she knows the joys of pregnancy and the joy of having a child, uh -huh. you would think that she would, her sister in the church, uh -huh. you, would you would think she would be praying for her, yeah. but instead of praying for her, what is she doing? She's talking behind her back. She's talking to, in front of her face uh -huh. and, and just taunting her and teasing her. Yes. All right? Talking about being bullied in the church. Yes. All right? I'm getting real here. Yes. How about, you know, you know when you're down. Yes. You know, right? Yes. I know when I'm down, right? Yes. Yes. The last thing I want when I'm down is for, is for somebody to kick me while I'm, while I'm down. Amen? Yes. All right. All right. That's the last thing you need, right? And the very, very last thing you need is somebody who's close to you, who's supposed to have your back, Sister Terry, and they give you a swift kick. But it's kind of on the DL, you know, oh, I didn't do it, so and so, so, so. But you know that you know that you know where it came from, eh, Amen. Amen. But instead of getting more bitter and more hostile, Hannah decided, I am going to up the ante with God. Yeah. So they made their way to Shiloh. When they got to Shiloh, I would imagine uh, Elkanah was doing his sacrifice and all he normally does. But she made her way to the altar because she knew where her help was coming from. She did not wait for her husband to say, okay, wife, well, now it's time for you to go to. No, she made her way to the altar because she had a petition that she wanted to lift up to God. And she didn't get tired. After those many years of making a 20-mile journey on foot to Shiloh and offering up the same prayer, she did not get tired. She didn't get weary, but she was feeling weary, okay? The Bible speaks of the fact that she didn't want to eat. Her continence was falling. But something happened in that last part, portion of that chapter where she decided... I am going to eat, and I am going to worship 
the Lord. And it says in the last verse there that they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ram. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her conception. But she had to pray first. She had to pray through first, didn't she? Hannah's prayer is significant because it illustrates her tireless pursuit of God's answer to her request. In the first chapter of Samuel, we find Hannah in a state of despair. Her husband, Elkanah, a godly man, loves her dearly. As a matter of fact, when they travel yearly to Shiloh to the tabernacle to celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacles, he gives her the larger portion of the food. So Peniah had time during his journey to mess with Peniah. She had time to bully her. She had time to just say, hey, 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 what's wrong with you? You ain't a woman. I'm the woman, I'm the woman, I'm the woman. I'm the one giving all, getting all the babies. What's wrong with you? You're supposed to be his favorite. I kind of wonder if there's a little bit of jealousy what's going on there. You know, as I was reading this passage of scripture, my mind went there and I said, I wonder if she was a little jealous because he gave her a little more food than she did. But unlike our present day and time, there are those who take pleasure in seeing someone else suffer for whatever reason. It could be jealousy, uh, to feel powerful, just to feel like, okay, I know something about you, so I'm going to hold that over you. That's right. So Penaya was at the advantage, and she knew it. She showed no caring or compassion. Yes, Hannah was bullied by Hannah, by Penaya, excuse me, and at the time it was one of the uh, sacred observances noted in the scripture. Penaya's mm -hmm. mind was not on praising God and giving thanks. This was her opportunity to make Hannah's life even more miserable. Sometimes you find in your dark time, everybody wants to talk to you, don't they? It's like, they, they, you know, everybody wants to talk to you. And it's like, okay, what, what, why is that? Fishing? <laughs> Fishing for information? Not praying, not prayed up? How are you? Oh, I'm so sorry about fill in the blank. I heard blank. What do you think about blank? And the list goes on and on. My grandmother used to say, don't be somebody's garbage can. Yeah, yeah. She used to say that, don't be nobody's garbage can. Um, I just want to say that while Eli made his accusation, if you will, of her being drunk, he had drama going on in his house with his two sons, Hophni and Phineas, right. who were, I'll just say it, sleeping around with the women at the church, yeah. right? So he was distracted also. Yeah. Right. He was distracted. But she vowed a vow to God, and God heard her prayer. Yeah. In the second chapter, Hannah prays a prophetic prayer. Yeah. And she prayed, my heart rejoiceth in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. So now her prayer has shifted to joy. She went from sorrow to joy. Because God heard her prayer. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none besides thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceedingly proudly. In other words, she's letting her enemies know, don't talk, don't talk about me anymore. <laughs> Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumble are girded with strength. They that are full have hired out themselves for bread, and they are hungry. They that are hungry are ceased. So that the barren, that's her, bore seven. Did you not know that she bore more children after that one son? She gave birth to more children. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raised up the poor out of the dust and lifted up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne 
of glory, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He will keep the feet. Oh my God. This is what really got me. He will keep the feet of his saints. When you think about your feet and the function that they have, I heard sister or mother um, Benning talk about her knees. But I also know that your knees help to support your legs, but then your feet have an even larger uh, job, and that is to make sure you're, you're steady, to make sure you're not wavering, to make sure that when you're walking, your walking is sure, your path is sure. So when God keeps the feet of his saints, that means that your, your steps are secured. He said that the steps of a good man, and I can say a good woman, are ordered by the Lord. But how can they be ordered by the Lord if you don't have him in your life and he is not directing you in prayer? That is why it is important to pray and to pray with power. So her countenance changed and she is singing, she is dancing before the Lord. And we see a significant shift in her prayer. So often when, when we watch others stumbling, and I talked about the feet for a reason, sometimes people's feet are not as secure as they should be in the faith. And that's the time when we should be praying and undergirding our sister, yes. right. holding our sisters up in prayer. Yes. And so when we see others stumbling and suffering, when we're not praying, yes. we're observing and not praying. Yes. And to add insult to injury, bring others to add to the shame, to observe. Uh -huh. You see, Hannah did feel ashamed at the time. She felt ashamed. She felt like a failure. But all we have to do in a time where we're feeling like we fail is to realize that we have to line up and measure up to the word of God. Yes. This is our measuring stick. You see, Hannah had to go through what she went through in order for God to position her for victory. Yes. She not only gave birth to a son, but she gave birth to one of the greatest prophets in the Bible, yes. Samuel. Yes. And he was the one that was positioned to take the place of the two sons that were cutting up in church. So God had her position and he had uh, her son position to move into that spot. Her prayer was bigger than I just want to have a baby. But God was orchestrating a change, a shift in the dynamic of his kingdom. Is it possible you are going through what you're going through to birth one of the greatest victories that are going to impact your generation. Is it possible? Is it possible that all the generational curses are now going to be broken in your life that preceded you? Is it possible that you're going through all this because you're going to be the one that's going to be the yoke breaker, the curse breaker, that God's going to empower you through prayer? He's going to empower you through prayer to get the job done. So Hannah brags on God. One would think that she could have taken this time to get back at Penina, but she decided, you know what? Forget that. I'm going to give God all the glory. I'm going to give him all the honor. I'm going to give him all the praise. Don't waste time fretting about what the enemy is doing. Be aware, but don't fret. Don't fret. Don't fret. The Bible says, fret not thyself because of evildoers. So it's always better to pray and praise and let God handle it. Pray for your enemies. That is what praying with power is all about. Invest your time praising God for he has already done the job. He is the God of our salvation. He is the God of restoration. And he is the lifter of our head. But before I go any further, let me also say, got to be plugged in to the power. Now, we were talking about the power at the Sunday school lesson on last Sunday, which I sat in on when I was at Foursquare last Sunday. And I said, whoo, this is good, because this is kind of dovetailing into what we're talking about on today. You know, a light doesn't mean anything if you don't have a bulb in it, amen? And a light doesn't mean anything if it doesn't have a plug. And guess what? If you don't pay National Grid, you can plug it in all you want to, but what's going to happen? Nothing's going to happen. So the first thing that needs to happen in the natural, if we're going to talk about natural, national grid, is the bill's got to be paid. Amen? Amen? And then once the bill is paid, then you're going to check your light and you're going to find out, well, gee, is there a short in the cord? What is going on with the light? 
And once you determine that that cord is okay, the next step is to get a bulb that's working. So everything has to be in place in order for the power source to do its job. What about our prayer life? Everything has to be in place. We have to have a life that's pleasing to God. I, you know, I'm not going to get on my knees asking God for anything if I know I've wronged my sister, my brother, or I know I haven't been obedient to his word. But there are those who do that. Amen? They do that. They feel, okay, God, is, uh, you're obligated to answer my prayer because I come to church every Sunday, so you're obligated that's right. to answer my prayer. But he wants us to have a life that's pleasing, pleasing to him. And once we line our life up with him, he can then deal with us. We can plug into the power source. I remember at the age of 12, we got saved, you know, at a young age back then. We, we had revivals all the time. And, uh, Mother Clark, Mother Juanita Barkins, excuse me, could tell you that we had revivals all the time. But I remember this particular revival, we were 12, and we were beginning to understand what it meant to be saved, and we wanted to become saved. And you know what, Sister Lisa, I was asking questions at that time. So at that point in time, we were all on the altar praying, seeking God, and the next thing we knew, Holy Ghost fell. And not only was I saved, but filled at the same time. Now, I didn't have a full understanding of what it meant. But as I walk with him, as I talk with him, I understand the importance of the power of God. I understand that when I was going through some situations and I had to pray and ask God for direction and guidance, he was the God that walks you through your season, amen? He's the God that can tell you when and what to do next. And I remember a time I was praying to him and it just seemed like everything was going haywire, amen? All right, everything was going haywire. But I was saying to God, I am faithful to you, I have been obedient to you, and the next thing I knew, he was turning it around. He was turning it around. He was turning it around. I know for a fact that prayer changes everything. There's no mistake about it. And it's not because I grew up in here all my life because I know some people who grew up in the church all their life and they still, you know, still wandering out there in the wilderness. They know, they heard, but they didn't apply it to their life. If you don't do anything else today after you hear this message, apply prayer. And even if you're praying now, pray, pray, pray some more. Pray is push. He pray. You until S something H happens. P pray. You until S something H happens. It's not something that we just get on our knees and we pray and we cry out. But we saw in the scripture here that Penaya went to Shiloh year after year after year after. Can you imagine walking 20 miles and walking 20 miles back and then have a whole year go by because this was a yearly um, feast of the tabernacles where they went to Shiloh and not have anything happen. Seemed like nothing was changing, but something was going on in the heavenlies. Something was going on. She couldn't see it, but God saw her posture. He saw her position change. And so when she says, I'm going to give you, give him back to you, God. I'm going to give him back to you. It seemed like at that point, God orchestrated the conception. Because when they came back, her husband knew her, and then not shortly thereafter, Samuel was born. Could it be that you are pushing, and you're getting ready to deliver, and you're at the point where you're like, ugh, I give up. This is, ugh, I can't do this no more. Ooh, he get on my nerves. Ooh, she get on my nerves. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I can't do this. You know pregnancy is nasty in the, in, the, in the natural, don't you? Oh, women, wait, those who know, wave your hand. Amen. Or just nod, just nod, just nod, just nod. I still watch them shows on TLC, and I see them pushing the babies out, and it's almost like I want to help them push the baby. I'm like, it's just that female thing, you know what I mean? But there's nothing pretty.
pretty about childbirth. I don't care what the movies make it look like. It is not pretty. And sometimes the woman is, she's not sweet. Because I've been in a delivery room with patients and I've been a patient, Brother Mike. And sometimes it's not a pretty thing. But in the spiritual, it's not pretty either. Because sometimes we're birthing, we're pushing, we're pushing and praying and interceding for our loved ones. We're pushing and interceding for those who we know. We know God is getting ready to do the breakthrough for them and the healing and deliverance. We know God's getting ready to do it. But it seems like right at the break, the enemy comes in. And that's when the distraction comes. But that's the time. They tell the woman, you gotta have a focal point. You gotta have a focal point. You gotta, you gotta get a rhythm, if you will, of these uh, contractions. All right? So sometimes the enemy can be hitting you upside the head, but you gotta be in position to bear down and say, I don't care what it looked like. I'm gonna push until God gives birth to my deliverance. Amen? I'm gonna push until I know I'm on the other side. I'm gonna push until I know my loved one is saved. I'm gonna push until I know the healing has taken place. Because I've seen God do it. I know he can do it. And no doubt Hannah saw Paniah popping out baby after baby, and she's like, God, I know you can do it. It's not a matter of me not believing in you, but while on others thou art calling, don't pass me by. Don't pass me by. I'm crying, Lord. Don't pass me by. Don't pass me by. So we are in position to give birth to what God yeah. is getting ready to birth through us yeah. in prayer. Yeah. And it takes power. Yeah. It takes perseverance. Yeah. The Bible says the effective and fervent prayer of the righteous avail much. Yeah. Avail, that means victory, doesn't it? Yeah. Avail means you made it on the other side. Avail. That's what you want is avail. Not a fail. You want to avail. You want to avail. So the position of prayer is important. It's not always being on your knees, but prayer positioning your spirit. When you know it's time to go into prayer, you can go in your secret closet at your desk at work or wherever you might be. You can go into your secret closet, Brother Mike. You can go any time. Because it's in the secret place. Yeah. He can meet you there. He can meet you right there at that point. Yeah. Oftentimes, you say, well, if I can hurry up and get to the church house, or you know that revivalist is coming, and ooh, if he lays hands on me, I'll fall out and I'll be all right. You better have a prayer right. spirit. Right. Better have a prayer life, because you don't know when. You don't know when the attack is coming. Right. And from whom it's going to come from. You know, in these days and times, nothing surprises me anymore. Amen? Amen? But I say this. You know, when her continence changed, that thing struck me. Because a lot of times, people think they can read you based on what's going on on your face. And yeah, sometimes the continence don't look so great. But I, I will tell you one thing of a surety. When God comes in, your continence will change. You don't have to bake the funk. <laughs> You don't have to fake it, but your countenance will change. So the position of prayer is so important, and even in the natural, the position of prayer is important. Uh, positioning is, is important in birth. You don't see a woman sitting on one of these chairs here giving birth. No. You know, they're going to be in, a, in the stirrups, the table, the whole nine yards. I won't get too graphic, okay? Some of them are in the water now. They're doing all kinds of different stuff now. All right, but when I talk about the position, the birth position in prayer, it is so key and it's so vital that when transition happens, and that's why when she said transition, that thing struck a chord in me as well because we're all in transition. I started out by saying that. That's the key point in the natural when a woman's giving birth is the transition. The transition 
is the difference between whether or not the baby is going to come out fine or do they have to shift to a, a C-section, you know things can go down quick. So we don't want to lose the baby in the natural. We don't want to lose the baby in the spiritual either. We want to be able to give birth to what God has promised us. He has given us so many promises. Promises of peace, promises of joy, promises of long life. The Bible lists a whole bunch of promises. But we don't want to miss the promise. The promises. Moses missed out. He missed out. He saw it, but he didn't go in. I want to go in. How about you? I want to go in. How about you? But it's going to take prayer. It's going to take prayer. It's going to take a whole lot of prayer. And we need to pray for one another. Let me rest on that for a little bit more. We need to be sensitive because this scripture illustrates insensitivity to another person's suffering. Totally insensitive. No discernment. That's right. Just assuming. So anytime we see one of our brothers or sisters down, pick them up in the spirit. If you don't know what to say, pray. That's always prayer is always in order. That's always in order. And when God gives you what to say, then say it. But you'd be so surprised how people just want you to listen. Listen to what they have to say. And that takes prayer too. Sister Yvonne, that takes prayer to be able to listen and be quiet and not talk about, well, child, I've been through that too, and blah, blah, blah. Not the time, not the time, not the time. It is the time to minister. And so prayer prepares us to minister to others, to lift each other up, to lift up. I enjoyed your song, Sister Leandia. What's his name? Jesus. If you don't know what else to say, you can say Jesus. A lot of times people say, I don't know what to pray. Come, start with Jesus, okay? Start with Jesus. Start with help. Help me, Lord. She sung that last Sunday. She, she sung all my songs, two Sundays in a row. Help me, Lord. If you don't know what else to do, say, help me, Lord. I need your help right now, God. Can I tell you the most seasoned prayer warrior has issues sometimes. Yes. Sometimes we don't know what to say. And then, guess what happens? The Spirit intercedes for us. Isn't that great? Uh -huh. In words that we can't even explain in other. When you hear people praying in the prayer language, and, and that's what was going on with, with Hannah. They, he thought she was drunk. No, she was praying, and the Spirit was interceding on her behalf. Amen. Interceding. I want to go back to the power again as I close. Ephesians 3 and 20 says, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. Let's stop right there. He's able to do above. Yes. I feel that he's able to do above. We're trying to pray a prayer, and God's got an even higher prayer that's going up that we can't even put into words. We think we got this down. No, no, Holy Ghost got it down, child. He got it down. He was able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or think. You can't even you can't even wrap your brain around it, sisters. You can't even wrap it. You can't wrap it. According to the power. That's it. Okay. Where's the power? That's the key. Where's the power? It's got to work in us. That's where it is. It's in us. Looking around for the Holy Ghost to fall down. It's in us. It's in us. And the day of Pentecost was fully calm and the Holy Ghost fell. It's the same Holy Ghost that fell back in Acts. It's the same Holy Ghost that's falling right now. And we need, we need his power as never before. We need him to give us what we need 
to make it in this season, whatever season you are in your life, wherever you find yourself right now, he is able to equip you, he is able to empower you. I don't care how daunting it looks, I don't care how intimidating it looks, he's able to give you the power, Pastor Steve. He's able to give you the power to get the job done, but don't try to do it in your own power. I'm not going to try to do it in my own power. Make a big, 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 big mess trying to do it on my own. But I thank God for the power of prayer. Because if we don't plug in, we're going to find ourselves lost. Things are going to be happening. Things are happening so quick right now. You've got to stay plugged in. You can't unplug. Oh, I think I'll unplug for a little bit, and then I'll plug back in later. No, 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 no. This is not the time to plug in, or not to be plugged in, amen? I had some songs that were...